Thank you all. It's great to be able to be here. And uh, speaker, thanks for your introduction. Thanks for taking the time to let me speak for a few minutes today. It's the 11th the time in the 12 years I've served in the Senate to be able to be here. Uh, the only time it didn't work out was a COVID year, and lots of things didn't work out um, that year. Um, I know you've got a lot going on. Probably the last thing you need is one more senator slowing you down, but uh, <laughs> things happen. Things happen. When I was the whip in the House, we would, uh, we would uh, tell the... Uh, tell the, the new members of the House that, uh, you know, the, the Democrats are our adversaries, but the Senate is our enemy, and they all immediately, immediately accepted that. You know, another thing I'd tell the new members in the House, the new Republican members particularly, was you're going to enjoy it here a lot more if you'll just start with the belief that everybody else here is as well motivated as you are. Uh, you know, people can have different ideas without being evil. There's nothing, nothing wrong with disagreeing with people's points of view, uh, but start doing that understanding that everybody got here to do the right thing. That might not be true 100% of the time, but it's true well over 99% of the time, and it just makes it a better environment if you start believing that. And I hope we can get back to more of those kind of politics. I am grateful for the willingness of every one of you to serve. You know, it's what democracy is all about, people being elected by constituents that may have different views of what the government should do, and then people coming together and trying to see how those views can meld into a consensus that moves the state forward, that allows for more opportunity, that uh, allows us to do what we want to do. You know, our government was designed to not to be efficient. The people that designed the federal government and the federal government model that became the, the model for our state governments was, was really designed by people who didn't trust government. They didn't want to make it easy for government to get things done, and on that front, they were incredibly successful. Uh, when you talk about uh, our government to people who have the more traditional parliamentary systems where if everybody doesn't, isn't able to get everything done, the majority wants to get done, then the government collapses and you have to try to put a new government together. Our whole concept of a government of checks and balances is uniquely ours and uniquely designed for people to have to come together in a pretty significant way uh, to move forward. Now, we have an opportunity, I think, that is greater than maybe we've had uh, in a long time. We've gone through a challenging period of COVID, of uh, uh, people having challenges that they hadn't had before. Uh, we begin to think more about supply chain issues and uh, where products come from, and all of that can be good for us. You know, the supply chain, uh, we're suddenly thinking about, well, where do all these chips come from that go in all these devices, and why is it that the ones that, are make, that we use to make cars and trucks with aren't as available as we'd always thought they would be. Um, the last, why is it that uh, that last part that suddenly we can't get means that something, a refrigerator can't be put together, an appliance can't work. Thinking about things, I'm a free trader and always have been, and I think trade and competition is a good thing, but when you're doing that, you wanna be sure that you never get yourself totally dependent on some other country or one source uh, and I think people are thinking about that uh, in different ways now, and that's to our advantage. Missouri is truly where the country comes together. Uh, the St. Louis, in many ways, is the westernmost eastern city. Kansas City, the easternmost western city. Northern Missouri and southwest Missouri and the Boot Hill or the Delta are incredibly different. Frankly, for those of you who get to work here, the discussion you have every day has probably more of a resemblance to the national debate than any other legislative body except the national body. I think our state is that reflective of what the country's all about. For four decades or so now, 
the, the exact the population center of America has been in our state, kind of moving roughly parallel with Interstate 44, uh, south and west as the population shifts south and west. We may not be the exact geographic center, but in so many ways we're the center of the country, and that gives us some advantages that uh, others don't have. Um, it's a unique time to think about how we make the most of those advantages. The, um, the, the whole idea of location is suddenly very important to us, I think. Uh, when you look at uh, what happened with COVID, uh, and again, thinking about how we bring more jobs back here, uh, it's to our advantage to uh, look at our location. Infrastructure is how we take advantage of that location. Uh, it's great to say we're at the center of where the rivers come together and the railroads come together and the highways come together, uh, but you and I working together have to do our best to make the most of that. The um, opportunity here is pretty great. Uh, the, the new infrastructure bill can be helpful to us. Um, you know, we have the ability to compete for uh, assistance we wouldn't have otherwise. The, the, uh, we just got $732 million to repair the first lock north of the Mel Price lock, three quarters of a billion dollars to help make the river more efficient. The river, rail, highway all coming together give us an advantage that we wouldn't otherwise have. You know, our economy is better too when we have an economy that's based on uh, making things and growing things. We're a very hands-on kind of economy. And so when people are looking about how they're going to, to reshore, uh, make manufacturing opportunities, that's gonna be really good for us. Uh, when people are looking at ways to bring those jobs back here, uh, we want to be sure that we have uh, the support structure that people need. The um, whole idea of how we, we prepare for that is important. Now, broadband, another issue that you all are thinking about in a significant way, as we saw people over the last two years uh, working at home, going to school from home, going to the doctor uh, from home, uh, things really began to change in the way people looked at their need to be connected. Uh, and we're now down to about 25% of Missourians don't have, rural Missourians aren't connect, don't have accessibility to broadband, and that's just no longer acceptable. And you're doing the things you need to do to step forward uh, and make that happen. Uh, the the uh, whole idea of what, what's happening uh, with health care, telework uh, also led to telemedicine. And uh, telemedicine is really important for behavioral health as well as overall health. You know, one of the issues I've worked on a lot has been the um, treating of mental health like all other health. And talk about a year of mental health challenges, people who had their addiction issues headed in the right direction, uh, people who had their behavioral health issues headed in the right direction, suddenly found out that those support systems weren't there for them like they had been. The structure you'd put in place that was helping you deal with these challenges was no longer there. And so we had to come up with new ways to do that and not with great success at first. You know, we had the suicide numbers were not, were higher than they had been. People sensed that they were uh, not connected to the society as significant in ways that it hadn't been. And we need to continue to look forward to be sure that we can make all of those things, all of those things work. Broadband for rural communities, one of the things, more people worked at home in the last two years than have probably worked at home in a century. And a lot of people found out, and a lot of employers found out, that working from home is not a bad, uh, a bad choice for some of their workforce. And if you can work from home, what does that mean? That means if you can work from home, if you can be connected to the greater economy, you can live where you want to live. In, Ameri in Missouri communities, big and small, 
And a lot of people would like to live in our smaller communities where, you know, people still, where school activities are still a big event, where you might not know every kid's name, but you know the house every kid lives in. That's really appealing to lots of people all over America, but that only works if we're properly connected. That only works if the broadband resources are there that allow people to be connected in a way that allows them to live where they want to live, make the kind of living they want to live. And just on the fundamental sense of, of uh, homework and other things that need to be done, this is an equity issue, and an equity issue I know you're committed to, the federal government's committed to, we're looking at what we need to do to make those kinds of connections. In terms of the economic opportunities in front of us, so much of the health research in the country is being done in our state now on cancer, on Alzheimer's, on autism, on issues that we need to be thinking about. Uh, the, uh, we, we've moved a number of the federal re ag research jobs to our state, to Kansas City. Between those jobs in Kansas City and the Danforth Plant Science Center and Bayer, uh, there are more plant, in the University of Missouri, there are more plant scientists uh, in, in Missouri than anywhere else in the world. And we need to figure out how we take advantage of that. We've got this great opportunity of world food demand doubling in the next, between now and 2060. And we've got the, the network, the rail, river, and road network to get those products all over the world. The new geospatial center in St. Louis creates an opportunity for us to look at this rapidly growing field of location science, of knowing where every car is, of knowing uh, where every product is in ways that other states don't have that opportunity. I think we're reaching out to do that. Uh, Harris Stowe University's got a coding program looking at how you can take artificial intelligence, look at all of the uh, material available to us and figure out quickly what a person needs to look at to determine what's going on and what that means. Our federally qualified health centers are critically important uh, deliverers of health care. And joining them are the behavioral centers. You know, I have a program that Senator Stabenow, a Democrat, a, a Democrat from Michigan and I sponsored in 2014, Excellence in Mental Health, where we're treating mental health like all other health. And by the way, the National Institute of Health says that one in five adult Americans has a diagnosable and almost always treatable behavioral health issue so if one in five adult Americans has a behavioral health issue, imagine how their other health issues are impacted in a positive way if you deal with the behavioral health issue the way it should be dealt with. People show up at, uh, at their appointments, they take their medicine, they do whatever they need to do to get that mental health part of their health life in line with the other health concerns that they need. Senator Stabenow and I went to the Senate floor the last day of uh, October in 2013 to talk about the last bill that President Kennedy signed into law, the, uh, the community mental health bill. And we, we spent about 30 minutes on the Senate floor going through the Community Mental Health Act that was 50 years old that day and realizing and pointing out how many of the things that that bill said needed to be done just didn't get done. A lot of facilities got closed that the bill said really weren't properly meeting the full needs of people who needed them, but the alternatives didn't get open. And our state has been a leader in this area of mental health for a long time. When 24 states applied to see uh, which state could put together a program that would be the, the eight pilot states for excellence in mental health, uh, Missouri was one of the eight states. And it wasn't one of the eight states because I sponsored the bill. Senator Stabenow also sponsored the bill, and Michigan wasn't one of the eight states. Uh, but what, what we've been doing in our state is trying to keep track of not just the mental health impact, uh, but also to keep, health, to keep track of the overall health impact and how much money you save on the other health cost when you deal with mental health costs in a way that everybody knows you should. Uh, this is a time to move forward, to get our workplace ready. 
I think when the governor was here just a few days ago, he talked about, about some pretty good statistics. Uh, I think we're number one in on-the-job training, uh, number three in apprenticeships. Uh, I think we're number seven uh, in technical manufacturing, pretty high on the list of best place for a military person to retire. And when a military per person retires, they're, they're like a retiring senator. They still got a lot of life left in them. Uh, and uh, we ought to be the best place, frankly, for military people to retire. We should be the best place for people to take their certificate from that they achieved in another state, move to Missouri, and go to work. We need to be doing everything we can to be sure that we've got a workforce ready for the opportunities. We've got the transportation system. I think we've always been careful in our state about doing everything we could within our control to be sure we paid attention to our utility bills. You know, if you're going to make something in America today, the first two questions you'd ask yourself would be, can, can we do what we want to do and pay the utility bill? And the second question would be, does the transportation system work for what we want to make? And if the answer to either, either of those questions, by the way, is, is no, there's no reason to go to question three. But if you keep those two questions headed in the right direction, question three is, do we have the workforce we need? And is it a, in, and is it a workforce in communities where people want to live? It's a lot easier to keep people happy uh, in your workforce if they live where they want to live than if you bring them somewhere where they don't want to be. And so what you do every day works hard to be sure that we have those communities where people want to live, works hard to be sure that we've got a workforce that's ready for the future and takes advantage of our natural advantages. I often say, and I may have almost said it twice today, but I didn't quite say it the way I, I say it, which is, the biggest advantage we have where we live is where we live. And you need to make the most of that, and I need to do everything I can to help you make the most of that. Roads, bridges, highways, rail, river. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're incredibly well located where we live and where our country is. Uh, we're going to see lots of good things happen. There's absolutely no reason that you and I can't see do what we need to to see those things happen uh, in Missouri. Uh, I'm glad to be here today. I'm glad that I've been able to work both in this building, uh, in a county courthouse for a dozen years as a county official, in the House of Representatives for, uh, for tw 14 years, in the Senate now starting my 12th year, and all of it has been work that uh, I've been honored and pleased to do, and I've been honored to do it with so many of you. You know, when I became the chief deputy whip in the House, my second term in the House, that was 1999, the person who'd had that job had just become the Speaker of the House, and suddenly this brand new member from Southwest Missouri takes his job. And I looked high on a brief, uh, on a bookcase in, in the office I then suddenly moved to in the Capitol, in the Capitol building itself. And on the top of that briefcase, there was this big bust of somebody. Uh, and uh, I said, what, what's that doing up there in the chief deputy whip's office on top of a brief? That looks pretty significant. And they said, well, I checked in. So it might be significant, but nobody's known who that was since at least 1930. And so I said, well, let's see if we can find out who it was. And the truth is we couldn't. Uh, it had been labeled the unknown cleric, Father Bob. When you got it down, and maybe that will be the bust of Father Bob at some time, the unknown cleric. When you got it down and looked at it, it was obvious it was a cleric. Uh, it was a clergyman of some type because of the collar and everything he had on. Uh, but there were newspaper articles going back to 1930 that just nobody knew who it was. So it was in the United States Capitol, and it was the unknown cleric and I got that down I put it to where every new member of the house could see it when they came by to visit with me and the point was this was a, this was a bus that could not have gotten in the capital earlier than 1830 and by 1930 nobody knew who he was and this is and everybody then wants to guess it is unguessable who he was because nobody knew who he was, and it just got lost into history. But the point is, and the point I've made with that statue of the unknown cleric many times, what we do here 
is more important than who we are. What we do here is more important than who we are. This job is about the future. Thanks for taking the responsibility to be responsible for the future, and thanks for letting me be here today. Thank you to all of you.